Torridon is one of the finest places in Scotland. Uh, all the North West is, but Torridon is special because I've got so many great memories of the hills. Being able to see the sea and the locks and the light up here is just wonderful. There's so much space. So those who just go in the hills or they go cycling, just go off the track and the space is just wow. And you see these mirrored air of locks about, it's just wonderful. I think people come to Torridon because it's got such a reputation built on, you know, various things like, you know, there's so many attractions, but just the remoteness of it all. Um, and from different places, you can see the islands like Sky and Rum and a Good Day and even Harris, if you get it right. It's just, just, just a wonderful place and it's still not uh, heavily populated. There is space for everybody here. scale production. In the many factories of the Avro Group, in the factories of other British aircraft manufacturers at home and overseas, many thousands of men and women toil night and day to produce the gigantic warplanes for Bomber Command. Lancaster flew from Kinloss. Uh, it was there and it was doing a training flight with crew and it went missing. these days, you know, there was no mobile phones, even 51 and very few telephones up here. And the area they were looking was miles, you know, all the way out to the islands and everywhere. And somebody in the village said they'd heard a crash or seen a bright light in the sky at night. Now you remember this is March 1951, and that's how they kind of tied it down to an area. But in 1951, these mountains were very in, they still are very inhospitable, but they're very remote then. So the team had to come and look, and it, it was this was not for three days because they could even start the search because they didn't know where it was. Nowadays, you know, aircraft carry beacons and bits and pieces, and it's a, a lot easier and technology's improved. But this was a you know a, an incredible incident at the time. I mean, they located wreckage th that first day, but I mean, March it's still, so they had a hugely long day uh, in full winter conditions. Now, I'm a climber, I've climbed up there. It's taken me three hours to walk in from the normal way in, so it must have taken them at least five or six hours, and they'd be breaking snow the whole way in. I mean, and uh, the photos show you how deep the snow was, and then they found wreckage at the bottom. Two things, they didn't have any, the kit was very poor, it was ex-World War II. You know, there was no mountaineering kit as we know it. They were all national service people. Everybody in these days did national service. And they were very lucky they had three or four mountaineers. And, and, and you know, when you look at the kit they've got, I mean, it was like the, what they used in the Arctic, thin jackets and layers and layers of um, army uniforms. There would be no radios as such. They had radios, but they didn't work very well. They couldn't handle the rain, you know, they couldn't handle the wet, the cold and everything else. So one can only imagine, and not only that, it's a horrific scene. And I know this was only a few years after the war, but a lot of these were young kids in that team. So they're coming across these casualties, you know, there was quite a few casualties, you know, everybody was killed in at various times having to pick them up in aircraft crashes. I've been to loads and not nice things. Sixty miles north of Cape Wrath. That is the last anyone would hear from the eight men aboard the 120 Squadron RAF Avro Lancaster TX-264. What happened on that fateful night in 1951 and what followed would change the face of mountain rescue in the UK forever. He 
Air Force uh, after the incident because there was a lot of bad press about it. But they did have an inquiry and then they decided the training wasn't good enough. So every year we will run a winter course in Scotland for two weeks. We'll get all the RAF teams up and we'll train them. We used to cramp on ice axes and looking after themselves and they started developing the equipment. And there was a guy, a guy called Johnny Lees, took over at Valley, and he he became a guide, one of the first guides in, in Britain, and he changed the system and how it all worked. And they wrote the first kind of handbook of mountain rescue, which the civilian teams had at the time. So it changed everything. It became far more professional. doesn't understand, I don't think, what, yeah, uh, oh God, there's a, quite, there's a big avalanche and it's front page news in every paper. Then they phone you up and say, right, give us a, and I says, yeah, but they, these, these things happen. We've done everything we can, but you know, what else can we do? And they, they don't understand their stats. And I did the statistics for 10 years. So I know exactly what's going on in the accident rate. And most people are very, very safe. And, and I said, is it not better? I hate to say this, somebody getting, you know, how do you compare with all the drunks that are fighting in London or Glasgow or wherever, getting drunk, pouring drugs into the system from some mountaineer or cyclist getting carried off the Lincoln Hill. I know where I'd rather be, you know? And there's no answer to that. This incident put Pedaria's mountain rescue training and equipment into sharp focus. The handbook that came out of this tragedy is currently in its seventh edition and is still used as a benchmark today. The RAF Mountain Rescue Service would be born from this, and the modern, volunteer-led teams would follow this pattern as the swinging 60s saw more people venture into the mountains. 